Western civilizations have often had a fascination with Eastern cultures. During British imperialism, many people became interested with the cultures of India and China. Although not considered as productive nor as profitable because of its geographic isolation, Tibet became an interest of the British, particularly because of its extraordinary religious ties. While the majority of nations throughout the world have at least some separation of religion and politics, Tibet developed into a theocracy, intertwining religion and politics nearly flawlessly. Throughout the nation's evolvement, relations between Buddhism and politics have caused turmoil, the most dramatic events occurring during the mid-20th century. The development of Tibet's theocracy and reliance on Buddhism is a primary factor in the Chinese communist political policies, whose impact can still be observed in the 21st century. When discussing the current social and political relationship between the nations of China and Tibet, one must first look at the history shared by these two countries. Tibet had been developing as a nomadic monarchy until the 7th century of the Common Era. At this time, Buddhism was formally introduced to the nation. Shortly thereafter, the Chan school of Buddhism emerged in China. The Chan school emphasized sudden enlightenment and focused on intuition rather than intellect. While these philosophies were prominent in southern China, they were not popular in Tibet, where locals tended to practice Mahayana Buddhism and considered enlightenment a gradual process. Still, these two nations shared the rapid spreading of Buddhism, and the development of numerous temples and monasteries. In his article, Buddhism in the Communist China, Demise or Coexistence, author David Yu attributes the rapid spread to the most powerful class. In both China and Tibet, Buddhism acquired a large following resulting in financial and political influence. For Western cultures, there is a common practice of separating church and state. This fundamental Western political practice, however, does not apply to the politics of Tibet. As indicated by Dawa Norbu in his article, The 1959 Tibetan Rebellion, an interpretation in Tibet, quote, the separation of church and state, so vital in Europe in breaking the clergy's monopoly of power and authority, did not occur in Buddhist Tibet until 1950, end quote. Both the national leaders and Lhasa, Tibet's largest city and capital, had political and religious responsibilities. The Dalai Lama was not merely a religious leader. He is considered to be the incarnate of Bodhisattva Avalokitesvara, but he is also the head of the government. The city of Lhasa was not only a central location for Buddhism, it was also the political center of Tibet. According to Trilok and Indra, Majupariya, the city was important because all the government offices were located in Lhasa. While religion and politics were not mutually exclusive, there were two sects of Tibetan government, civil and religious. In order to maintain a certain level of equality, both monks and lay people were involved in the government. Both monastic and lay officials handled the criminal and civil cases of the area. Not only are the theocratic tendencies of Tibet polarized to typical Western civilizations, but so is the development of its government. The development of Tibet's government was atypical compared to most other nations throughout the world, and especially those of Western society. While European nations tended to develop first as theocracies, then into monarchies, Tibet evolved inversely of this model. Initially, Tibet was a powerful monarchy, but between the 8th and 12th centuries of the Common Era, the government shifted to a theocracy. During this time, there was still some separation between religious and political practices. In 1642, however, nearly the whole of Tibet came under the 5th Dalai Lama's rule. At this point, the Dalai Lama was no longer simply a religious leader. He also held a legitimate political authority. A century later, Tibet formally created a government called the Kashag. The Kashag was composed of four men, usually two monks and two laymen. Though the government structure of Tibet was only slightly variant from others around the world, the passive political practices made Tibet's government unique. While Buddhism spread across Asia, there was never an articulation as to what might be termed 
Buddhist, social, or political philosophy. Despite the absence of a specified philosophy, the leaders of Buddhism held a great amount of influence. The financial and social power wielded by the Tibetan leaders, however, was seldom used to create socio-political change. Likewise, when Buddhism spread throughout Tibet and other nations, it rarely demanded an either-or decision from peoples of non-Buddhist backgrounds. Rather than using force, like many of the surrounding nations, the influence of Buddhism and Ahimsa, the practice of non-violence, allowed for peaceful coexistence between various cultures. As Tibet became more independent as a region, China maintained its imperial tendencies. Throughout the Common Era, the Chinese continually tried to maintain control in Tibet. The control China utilized, however, was indirect. According to Dawa Norbu, from 1260 to 1950, there was no attempt at outright conquest or semi-permanent military occupation, or even direct rule. During the 17th and 18th centuries, the British became increasingly consumed with the nation of Tibet. After the Chinese became independent of British control, they began to expand, similar to dynasties before, but they were not nearly as effective. During the 18th century, the Chinese took control of Tibet. Once again, the Chinese had control of the region, but the internal affairs of the Tibetan people were controlled by the Tibetan government. Though there were several diplomatic disagreements between Tibet and China, there were very few violent efforts to change the relationship between the two. In 1921, the Chinese Communist Party was founded and molded after the success of the Russians. Unfortunately for the Tibetan people, a systematic prosecution of Buddhists lingered a mere few decades in the future. Although Western society attributes communism to the violent political policies against Buddhists, there were previous attacks on the typically non-violent nation of Tibet. Throughout the Qing and Tang dynasties, the Chinese invaded Tibet. The Tang dynasty engaged in several battles with the Tibetan Bitsans, or warrior kings. These attacks were part of an imperialistic nation's tradition. According to Norbu, there is a deeply internalized sense of territoriality in China, which results in boundary building and boundary maintenance. Although the boundary between China and Tibet was created sometime during the 8th century, the Chinese tried to expand their empire and control Tibet. Throughout the relationship between China and Tibet, there have been several claims of independence. Although Tibet controlled internal affairs, it was not considered an independent nation from China. In 1913, the Dalai Lama declared Tibet to be an independent state, and this was recognized by Great Britain, but never accepted by China. Given that the Chinese company refused to accept the Tibetan Declaration of Independence, the Tibetan Kings would make another country. While China was divided between nationalists and communists in July 1949, foreseeing complications, the Tibetan government broke off diplomatic ties with China and again asserted its independence. Like the previous Tibetan claim of independence, this was not validated by the Chinese government. According to George Ginsburg's and Michael Mathis, on no occasion was this move accepted by the Chinese authorities, neither by the communist regime, nor his Kuntag rival. With tensions rising, particularly after the Chinese invaded Tibet on October 7th of 1950, it would be a de decade before the Tibetan government would try to claim independence for a third time in half a century. Finally, the Tibetan government took action on March 12th of 1959, and the Dalai Lama's cabinet unilaterally denounced the agreement between China and Tibet and declared Tibet an independence. The result of this final act was a cultural revolution and the eventual destruction of Tibetan society. When addressing the rising threat in Tibet, the Chinese Communist government made several political claims. In order to appease the Tibetan people, the Chinese made promises that they would respect the Tibetan religion and repeatedly pledged themselves to grant the province autonomy under the unified control of the Central People's Government. Religious freedom and autonomy were key points to negotiating with the Tibetans, since these were the nation's goals. Article 88 of the Constitution allowed citizens of the People's Republic of China to have freedom of religious belief. Although religion was not an ideal of the Communist Party, it appeared as though religion would be accepted.
In a speech, Communist leader Mao Zedong claimed, We cannot use executive order to stamp out religion, nor can we force people not to believe religion. Although this assertion seems to indicate a tolerance by the Communists for Buddhism, the actions of the party contradict the political claims. It should come as no surprise that the claims of the party to the Tibetans contrasted the actions taken. Tibet was granted a supposed regional autonomy. The nation, however, was categorically incorporated within the framework of the Chinese Communist 